Hey, good morning everyone, Trackman44 here. Hey, today is the day we're gonna go ahead and change out this uh, new old central air conditioner. It was one that was in the house. When the house went under foreclosure, we totally renovated the system. This is has too much capacity or too great of a, uh, physically too large BQ capacity wise than what's required now that we've got the whole system uh, split apart and renovated. So we're gonna be uh, pumping this guy down. We're gonna be setting a new properly sized unit up on top of the new brackets. We're going to be going ahead and wiring it in, piping it in, evacuating it, going ahead and charging it up and uh, firing it up. What we're going to do, we're going to isolate this from the control circuit so that I can operate it manually here on the contactor because it's got a little pressure switch on it that might drop it off as I'm pumping the system down. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the service valve on the liquid line and close that off. That's going to lock the refrigerant in the condenser and not allow it to go into the, uh, to the indoor coil. Then what we'll do is we'll start the system while we're monitoring our gauges and watch until our gauges begin dropping on the suction side. And when it gets down somewhere around 40 PSI, that's going to be 40 PSI vapor on R410. We'll go ahead and let the system shut off once we get down to about 35 or 40 PSI. And then we will go ahead and close to the suction service valve and that'll isolate probably about 95, 98% of the charge in the condenser the charge that's actually in the existing system. And then we're just going to have a little bit of vapor that's going to be trapped in the suction line, that liquid line, and the evaporator that we're going to have to recover uh, with the recovery machine. Once this is out of the way, I'll just back the old truck up and we're going to set the new unit right up here on top and then go about the business of reusing the same Freon lines because the new unit is also R410A. So we don't have to worry about uh, flushing the line sets or changing the line sets. You'll be glad to note that the Franken furnace that we uh, temporarily installed by taking the supplier off of the existing system and dumping it into the return and then turning the blower on on the new system that did not have air conditioner on it, that Franken, Franken furnace worked out very well for us. Kept this house very, very comfortable for the length of time it took us to, uh, to receive the unit and then of course scheduled the time to go ahead and get it installed. So uh, we're actually tickled, uh, tickled. The only extra expense he had was the cost of the additional blower running over the cost of the normal simple air conditioning system. But that's okay because he cycled the thermal, allowed the blower to shut off and cycle off on the, on the new system and just let this run 24-7 to keep air in circulation and keep the heat de-stratified within the, uh, the upper levels of the lower floor on the two-story structure. And of course the second floor has its own separate system now uh, that we've installed in the attic a couple of years ago. We're going to be making a copper to copper joint and what we're going to be using is what's called a 15% uh, silver solder. Because it's copper to copper there's no flux required and only somewhat of a cleaning if it's a real tarnished or exceptionally dirty piece of material. Uh, normally the temperatures that this stuff gets to it burns off any of the minor contaminants that might be on the surface or inside the joint. You don't have to worry about it. 15% silver uh, it actually begins the process of melting at about 1200 degrees or thereabouts and then it flows like a soft solder once it gets very near to 1500 degrees. The recommendation on using the 15% uh, the is to be purging continuously dry nitrogen through the system at a very, very, very low pressure just to create an inert atmosphere because that way the, the oxygen or the carbon carbonizing flame of the oxygen acetylene won't burn and tarnish the inside of the pipe and create carbonization on the inside of your pipe joint. I do that quite frequently. Don't happen to have any nitrogen with me, but it is recommended to purge nitrogen. All the time. Now if you look really, really closely, what I like to do is just test the joint to kind of see how warm it gets. Because so as soon as you see it's ready to go, that's the oil inside the line. We're going to have to purge that to get rid of that. But you see right there, it's already begun, uh, begun to melt. Now you can see how um, all that carbon and stuff is on the outside of that pipe. It's actually on the inside of the pipe. So I got to, uh, I've got to flush that out and I'll clean that with a little brush before I go any farther. But that was just the oil, the, uh, the residual oil that was around the surface of the pipe that ignited there. 
and I got to shut the alarm off. Now solder will follow your heat and if you take a look at this if you were to clean this all up and everything you'll see there's a lot of solder on the outside but you'll also see uh, the solder trail that goes upwards. That solder trail that goes upwards on the outside is literally how far the solder actually penetrates and is drawn up inside the cup on the inside. So you don't really want to just seal right around the edge. You want to draw it up into that cup to get a good solid seal and then what you like to do is what they call putting the cap on it. You'll go back and just very gently with a softer flame and pulling your heat back, lay just a gentle cap all the way around the outside edge of the joint, sealing the stuff that you, the solder that you drew up inside the cup, sealing it in even, uh, even a little bit better. Now if you notice there's a funny looking little torpedo looking thing hanging out here on what looks to be a spring. Anytime you're soldering in and around one of these guys here, you want to make sure you take care to cover it with a wet rag. Uh, maybe just draw it completely over and out of the way where there's no chance you can add heat to it. Because what that is, that's a sensing bulb off of the thermostatic expansion valve, which is the metering device inside the evaporator coil. It's refrigerant filled in that bulb. Refrigerant pressure and temperature are directly proportionate. In other words, with an increase in temperature, there's an increase in pressure. So what that does when it clamps onto this line, after the system's in operation, it will monitor the temperature of the refrigerant passing through this line going back to the compressor. And as that pressure increases or that temperature increases, this will increase in pressure and put more pressure on the diaphragm, which will push down and then allow it to meter more refrigerant in to do more cooling. Because the warmer temperature here will indicate to the sensing bulb that it needs to produce more refrigeration because the load is getting bigger, greater in the house than what the current amount of refrigerant flowing through the metering device is, cap is capable of holding. So that's one of the reasons why you want to make sure you take extreme care not to heat this thing or overheat it. Just keep it out of the way. Put a little dribble on it. And you can just chase it wherever you want it to go. Drawing it up into the cup, like I said. And no solder joint is complete until it's cooled down and inspected very closely with a mirror and a flashlight. Now with the new AC up on the bracket, it'll be simple just to make the refrigerant line connections. Now 7 8 OD, if you ream it just a little bit with a, uh, with a, a tubing reamer, will accept a three-quarter OD right inside. So all you have is one little slip joint right here, and you're able to go ahead and push it up in there any distance that you want. So we've essentially got uh, three solder joints right here, and we're gonna be done.
now that we've got the refrigerant lines hooked up and sealed, and we know that there's no leaks, everything's clean, we're evacuating the system. Uh, now, you have to stop and think, what does that mean to evacuate? Well, to evacuate means to draw your air and possible contaminants, contaminants out of the system. Think about water and how water boils at atmospheric pressure at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Water in a vacuum or a negative pressure boils at a very much lower temperature. So by drawing this down to 29 point, uh, 29 point whatever um, in inches of vacuum, we're going to allow whatever moisture that got in, entered into the circuit to evaporate or boil out at this outdoor temperature. Right now it's about 89, 90 degrees or something like that. So we're literally dropping the pressure inside the system to where any moisture that's accumulated will be burst, will burst into a, a vapor and be drawn out of the vacuum pump and discharged right into the atmosphere. Air is a non-condensable. And by that, what I mean is you cannot condense the air and get any uh, and turn it into a liquid like you do the refrigerant vapor. So by being a non-condensable, if you leave air in the system, first off, you're leaving moisture in the system, depending on the humidity content in the air, the grains of moisture uh, in the uh, or of relative humidity that's in the atmosphere during the time you have it open. But what will happen is those non-condensables will travel to the highest point in the condenser, and they will actually hover and stay in the top portion of that condenser, and the refrigerant will force its way through that non-condensable uh, air. And so by drawing it into a vacuum, you remove that potential and that uh, resultant ridiculous fluctuation in head pressure that you see so often. So that's what we're doing now. We've got it on a vacuum. I do not have my micron gauge with me, but if I did, I would go to uh, 29 inches of vacuum and then begin reading the microns and try to get as low on the scale as I possibly could. Well, there's always been multiple ways of checking your charge on, on air conditioning systems. The new ones seem to be a little more critical, especially with the 410A, as far as I'm concerned. There's two, there's a chart that actually comes with the unit in the instructions and underneath the electrical cover for dry bulb outdoor temperature. It tells you what the approximate um, suction pressure should be and what the approximate head pressure should be. And I won't go into extreme detail, but we are we are just running right almost perfectly on that particular uh, uh, set, that that particular reading, which is really good. That means we're very very close to the correct charge. The second thing that you do, which is slightly more accurate, is you can actually do a subcooling method. The subcooling method, you have to put a, a very accurate digital thermometer on the liquid line or on the small line and read the temperature of that line and then you can convert the head pressure, which is also the pressure that's in that line, convert that to temperature and subtract the two and the difference of the two should be a specific amount. And for today's temperature, they want six degrees subcooling on the liquid line and we're dead nut, 6.2 degrees subcooling on the liquid line. So all around, we're in actually pretty doggone good shape as far as charge is concerned. Now, like I said, I can go into extreme detail, but it's not that necessary. It just, uh, we're kind of hitting the high spots here. This really ain't a technical video for anybody at all. It just kind of letting you know what we have to go through sometimes to get a system up and running. Everything is completely tied in, of course. You know, you can see a little bit of moisture dripping off of the suction line, which is, is fairly normal. And you can tell it's reasonably quiet. And the second unit over there, the attic system is also running uh, really quiet. So we're satisfied with that so far. So we've got a few more preliminary checks to make and I think we're gonna be done in no time. Well guys, that's about it for this one here. We have pretty much put it to rest. Everything's running, it's cooling. We've got a good temperature drop inside on the indoor coil. We've got a good temperature rise here. We've got what we're supposed to have. And we've got, most importantly, we've got really, really accurate charge in the system. So it should run as efficient as it's capable of running. That having been said, I don't have anything else to add to it. And this is Trackman 44, and I'm out of here, guys.